As part of the research that I recently completed, we were looking exactly at what is hyperbaric's effect on our epigenetics, on our biological age, and ultimately, what impact might that have on longevity? The fields of longevity and regenerative medicine have been growing rapidly for the last handful of years. Everybody's looking for ways of living longer, improving their life, really improving their quality of life, improving their health span, and looking for all the different tools and strategies in order to achieve these healthier and longer lives. Hyperbaric oxygen is well positioned inside the field of longevity and regenerative medicine, and the research is starting to catch up with what we've already known for the last 25 years. And that's what we're gonna talk about in today's video. So this is the fourth video in a series of videos that we've been doing covering the details of the research project that I recently finished. To understand what that research project was, what the design was, the methods, what we were measuring and what the protocol ultimately ended up being for this research, we covered all of that in detail in the first video of this series. So if you're interested in that, check the link below, grab that video and potentially watch that video first so you understand what this project was all about. Sequentially, video two was a detailed description of what response we had on the inflammatory markers and the cytokines that we ran. Video three was on quality of life and the computerized cognitive assessment that we did. This is video four looking at biological age and epigenetics. So having done this for over 20 years, I was expecting certain findings. I inherently knew that hyperbaric is going to be affecting the epigenome, which is why I wanted to utilize this testing in our research. There was a project a few years ago, many of you are already aware of hyperbaric's effect on telomere length. And while that was an incredibly important study, I really wanted to do a genome-wide epigenetic assessment that while I believe increased telomere length is a critical finding in the field of longevity and regenerative medicine, a genome-wide methylation panel would really give us a better indication of what's happening in terms of our epigenetics, our environmental signaling, and some of the real mechanisms that our body is using for this longevity and regenerative response to hyperbaric oxygen. I really figured that higher pressure was gonna have a much larger impact on biological age and epigenetics than lower pressure. And I thought that it would just take longer for the lower pressure group to eventually catch up to meeting some of the same benefits as the higher pressure. But in fact, what we found was vastly different than that. One interesting finding was that in the first 25 hours of the treatment, rather than a reversing of the biological age, in the high pressure group, we saw an acceleration of the aging process. Now, we saw that only on some of the aging clocks, and I believe that that was due to the increase in oxidative stress that that higher pressure group probably experienced relative to the low pressure group. So in the first 25 hours of treatment, the low pressure group had a small reversal of biological age, and the high pressure group had a statistically significant acceleration of the aging process. Now, after the next 25 hours, so 50 hours total, the low pressure group continued to have a reversal of the biological age and the high pressure group not only caught up to the low pressure group, but actually then reversed beyond what the low pressure group was able to do. So the impact on biological age was both had a statistically significant impact on biological aging, higher pressure had an accelerated and then caught up and then a reversal, whereas the low pressure group just had a continual reversal of aging slower over that same period of time. In more details, we looked at what's called DMLs and EBPs. DMLs are differentially methylated loci. So we looked at over 900,000 methylation locations, CPG islands inside of the epigenome. It was a genome-wide assessment. And we also looked at what's called EBPs, epigenetic biomarker proxies. These are measuring epigenetic changes and then using that as a mirror into understanding the biochemistry of the body. And there's a very high correlation. There've been a few published papers on the correlation between actual levels measured in the blood of certain markers and its associated changes in the methylation panel. These EBPs could also be used to understand what kind of physiological changes are happening inside the cell, as well as potential predictors of future disease. And so these markers are really important understanding not only biological age, but actually biological health. There is way too much detail to go into to make one video on this entire part of the project, but I just wanna go over some of the highlights. So as far as the differentially methylated loci, the DMLs, we found 134 DML, so differentially methylated loci, inside the high pressure hyperbaric group. So 134 locations were statistically significantly changed as a result of the hyperbaric project. In the mild pressure group, there were 27 DMLs that were statistically significantly changed. So a lot more DMLs in the high pressure group than the low pressure group. Of the 134 in the high pressure group, 114 of them were hypermethylated, increased levels of methylation, and the remainder were hypomethylated, so reduced levels of methylation. And in the 27 from the mild group, 
14 of them were hypermethylated and 13 of them were hypomethylated. From an epigenetic standpoint, when you hypermethylate a location, you are suppressing that genetic information. You're turning a switch off. When you hypomethylate, when you reduce the amount of methylation in a region, you are increasing the expression of that gene. You're turning it on. And what we know about health and disease states is it, it has a lot to do with turning on and off these different switches. And we know that environmental signals are one of the strongest influencers of turning a signal on or off. In many cases, especially if you look at theories on aging and theories on disease, one of which is the informational loss theory of aging. What that says is a cell is supposed to behave in a very specific manner. And as we age or as we become ill, a cell starts to express characteristics of other cell types inside of our body, not specific to that cell type. And so it's the epigenome's responsibility to suppress that information that is not inherent to that cell to make sure that to keep that cell functioning normal, that that cell should only express those characteristics that relate to that cell's functions. And restoring epigenetic hypermethylation should suppress a lot of that additional inappropriate and undesirable genetic information. So just to summarize epigenetics as simply as I can, because ultimately this could be an eight or nine hour video all unto itself. But I just want to create a level playing field so everybody understands the next little bit of information with regard to the effect that hyperbarics had on the epigenome. So every cell in your body started as one initial cell that started to replicate. And so while this is a gross oversimplification of this entire concept, I just want to make sure that you have enough information to really understand how important the impact of some of this research actually is. Inside any one of your cells is the information to be any other one of your cells. In other words, your liver behaves like a liver. However, inside the DNA of any given liver cell has the instructions to be a neuron or a kidney cell or an intestinal cell or a skin cell. So as a developing embryo and our cells are replicating, every one of our cells has the instructions to be any one of our cells. But once that cell differentiates, it only uses the instructions that it has based on that cell type. So a liver has all of these instructions, but it only really has access to the instructions of how to be a liver cell. Your skin cells have all the instructions to be any other cell in your body, but the way it behaves and the functions that it has only relate to that of a skin cell. A major role of our epigenome is the ability to suppress information. So imagine you have all of these instructions inside your cell, but the liver only expresses those, which means the epigenome is literally suppressing all of this other information inside the cell. In addition to something like telomere length, which is a protective cap on our DNA, protecting it from oxidative damage, our epigenome and our ability to turn on genes or off genes based on environmental signals to keep our body healthy and functioning well, a healthy epigenome will know exactly which switches to turn on and turn off in order to have the most appropriate responses to any environmental signal that we are exposed to. What we looked at in this research are different areas of increased or decreased methylation so that we could start to assess which genes hyperbaric may be turning on and which genes hyperbaric may be turning off. And essentially, that's what a DML is. A differentially methylated loci is a location inside the epigenome that is either increasing methylation or decreasing methylation, essentially turning a switch on or off accordingly. So just to give you some highlights as far as these DMLs and what impact the higher pressure had versus the lower pressure had, one important point to mention is that in the 134 that were affected by high pressure, there was zero similarity with the 27 that were affected by the lower pressure. In other words, lower pressure affected 27 locations, half of which were hypermethylated, about half were hypomethylated. And those 27 were completely independent and completely different of the 134 that the high pressure affected. So each one of those was having a statistically significant effect on our epigenome, and each one of those was having a very different statistically significant effect on our epigenome. To break those results down categorically, just to make it a little bit easier to understand, I was looking for patterns. And so what I would say is in the low pressure group, the 27 that were affected had much more to do with reducing inflammation. And the genes that were affected from the lower pressure group on inflammation would have reduced systemic inflammation, including neurological inflammation. Some of these genes are tightly connected to cancers and neurological diseases, including late stages of dementia or even autism. We also saw a few genes that were affected that would have stimulated an improved immune balance. So increasing our capacity to fight infection while also reducing our global inflammation. 
but categorically, the majority of genes that were affected in the mild pressure were immune related. In the high pressure group, there were also quite a few genes that were changed in relationship to fighting infection and reducing inflammation. But another interesting category that showed up was our ability to not only, let's say, improve telomeres to protect our DNA strand, but actually to repair DNA damage. And so some of these genes that were affected in the high pressure group are associated with repairing DNA strand breaks and genes that are associated with DNA repair as well as overall genetic stability. We also saw genes impacted that are associated with mitochondrial function as well as tumor suppression. So there were quite a variety of different genes affected in the high pressure group. Quite honestly, even at this time, I've only gone through about 60% of all the DNA epigenetic information that I have, and we're learning more about what these markers mean every day. So a month from now, six months from now, a year from now, I'll be going back into this research to assess now that we know what these locations mean, what did this research actually show us with regard to the impact on our overall health as a result of either the mild pressure group or the high pressure group. These epigenetic changes would be associated almost mirror images as if we measured blood levels of certain metabolites. And the correlation between the relationship between this change in the epigenome and this change in the amount or the volume of this metabolite inside of our blood relate to one another very, very closely. In both cases, the mild pressure group and in the high pressure group, we saw a lot of different mitochondrial changes, changes that were associated with a decrease in glucose metabolism and an upregulation of fat metabolism, making our mitochondria more ready to accept fat molecules, which would allow them to burn at a higher rate and actually produce much more ATP more efficiently. We will get right back to that video, but just real quick, if this information is helpful for you, if you don't mind, I'd really appreciate, like it, subscribe to the channel, and then share it with somebody who you think would benefit from this type of information. And now back to our video. In the lower pressure group, we also saw precursors of a variety of different increases in osteogenic and fibroblastic markers. In other words, indications that the mild pressure group is stimulating cartilage repair, soft tissue repair, and even bone repair. And while we know hyperbaric is capable of stimulating soft tissue repair and bone repair, studies that have assessed that have only looked at higher pressure, 2 to 2.5 atmospheres, and its effect on fibroblast activity and collagen synthesis. Here are some lower pressure indications that it's also stimulating on the DNA and epigenetic level, the stimulation of these genes associated with collagen repair, soft tissue repair, and bone repair. And lastly, I just want to discuss a really interesting development that occurred while I was crunching all of this data. The lab that ran all of the epigenetic data for my research project approached me and said, Yale is wanting to do a meta-analysis on different longevity strategies. So they contacted this same epigenetic lab and asked them to approach the researchers who have been using them for their own epigenetic data collection. They then wanted to compile a meta-analysis of different longevity approaches and assess what their impact was on an epigenetic level and a biological aging level. This meta-analysis included healthy individuals looking to improve their longevity, as well as disease processes that would reduce somebody's longevity as a consequence of the disease and which treatments actually improved their longevity the most, even in a disease state. This meta-analysis looked at different drugs, drugs associated with diabetes, drugs associated with AIDS, as well as other drugs that are associated with different chronic diseases. It also looked at general strategies for improved health and wellness, like certain diets, Mediterranean diet, low-carb diet, high-protein diets. It also looked at fasting. It looked at combinations of certain dietary changes and exercise. It even looked at different anti-senolytic drugs that people are using in the longevity space. And it compiled this meta-analysis of all these different strategies and which strategies are having the highest impact on biological age and longevity. The top three or four were all very specific drugs related to disease processes. So the top two were antiretroviral medications used in HIV and AIDS. In other words, if someone has HIV and AIDS and they take an antiretroviral medication, their likelihood for longevity improves dramatically. The next was metformin and associated with diabetes. So if a diabetic patient is taking metformin, the likelihood that that has a huge impact on longevity was very high. The next most powerful tool was high pressure hyperbarics. And the next most powerful tool was low pressure hyperbarics. So in looking at, I think of 51 different strategies for longevity, literally outside of HIV and AIDS and diabetes, 
Hyperbaric, both in low pressure and in high pressure, were two of the strongest modalities that anyone could use to improve their longevity and reverse their biological age. This is an incredible finding for anybody truly interested in improving their quality of life and really pushing the limits of longevity or really reversing the biological aging process. And so what are the implications of all of this? And not just the epigenetic information, but even the, the cytokine and cognitive performance. Here's what we know. We know that lower pressure and higher pressure all have an effect on our bodies biologically, physiologically, and even epigenetic or genetically. What this research has helped us to understand is that it's not just whether it's low pressure that either works or doesn't or high pressure that works or doesn't, they're both working. And in some cases they're working similarly, but in many cases, they're actually working very differently, which also means that there's not one pressure that any one person needs indefinitely. In fact, not only should there be periods where we use hyperbaric a little bit more, periods where maybe we take breaks from hyperbaric, but there should be periods where we're doing lower pressure, periods where we're doing moderate amounts of pressure, and maybe periods where we're doing higher amounts of pressure because different pressures are seemingly having different effects. Obviously, a lot more research needs to be done in order to pinpoint exactly what's happening and when, but this is definitely helping to add to the conversation with regard to the fact that different pressures are having these different responses, and we should all be utilizing that in terms of our exposure to a range of pressures over a range of time. I know this is really just the beginning, and I assumed that it would be when I did the research. If we cast it a wide enough net and we asked enough questions, now we can start to pinpoint, now that we know which areas higher pressure and lower pressure are affecting, now we can really develop more specific research studies in order to really flesh out additional and more specific protocols depending on a person's health goal or a person's health concern. Every time I teach a class, I start that class with, this is the most exciting time to be a part of hyperbaric medicine. And then a few months later, when I teach my next class, I say, this is the most exciting time to be getting involved in hyperbarics because literally every few months we're learning more, we're developing more, new research is coming out, more protocols are being developed. And so this is the most exciting time to be involved in hyperbarics. And I hope you enjoy this video and I'll see you next week. As most of you know, I've been teaching and certifying people in hyperbaric medicine for the last few years. What was missing was a concise textbook on the off-label use of hyperbaric oxygen. There are a handful of textbooks out there. They're all exclusively on the 14, which are now 15, FDA-approved hyperbaric indications for hyperbaric use. There is not a single textbook out there on the off-label use, and most importantly, not a book that really goes into the detail of the mechanisms of action. You've seen my videos on mechanisms of action. You understand how important that is to me for you so that you could really understand where hyperbaric fits in this vast world of chronic illness. This book, The Art and Science of Hyperbaric Medicine, is just that. It is the official textbook that will go along with all the courses that we teach, but it's also a standalone book. If you're looking to learn more about hyperbaric oxygen, more about the indications, the contraindications, the off-label use, the mechanisms of action, this is the book that you're really gonna wanna get your hands on. So click the link in the description below and grab yourself a copy today.